Morning. 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 Today is the fourth Sunday after Epiphany. For the service today, we're going to be following white one, which you either have in the big bulletin or starting on page 41 in the front of the hymnal. And we'll begin today with the opening prayer. O Lord, our maker, redeemer, and comforter, we are assembled in your presence to hear your holy word. We pray you to open our hearts by your Holy Spirit, that through the preaching of your word, we may be taught to repent of our sins, to believe on Jesus in life and death, and to grow day by day in grace and holiness. Hear us for Christ's sake. Amen. We sing hymn number 202, and please stand for verse 4. Let us confess our sins to God and pray. We poor sinners confess to you, O God, not only that we have been conceived and born in sin, but also that throughout life we have often and in many ways offended you, our Lord and Maker, in thought, word, and deed, so that you could with perfect justice reject and condemn us for all eternity. Therefore, we come before you with sorrow of heart, in dread and terror of your holy justice and of everlasting death. Our sins are a grievous foe, which we should hate in every way as long as we live. O merciful God, you still grant us in this hour to be reminded of your fatherly goodness. According to the promise of your word, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy and implore you, dearest Father, For the sake of Jesus Christ, your only begotten Son, our brother, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised again for our justification, forgive us all our sins through faith, which the Holy Spirit increases in our hearts to full assurance. We therefore pray you, O Lord, through your servant, to declare to us the forgiveness of all our sins. We poor sinners are willing to forgive all who have offended against us. We earnestly desire to grow in true godliness. 
Help us, O God, for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Hear the holy and comforting word of our Lord. Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Lift up your hearts. By the authority of God and of my holy office, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to God in the highest. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Let us pray. Almighty God, you know that we are set in the midst of so many and great dangers, and that because of the weakness of our mortal nature, we cannot always stand upright. Grant to us such strength and protection as may support us in all dangers and carry us through all temptations. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one true God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The Old Testament reading is from Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 through 17. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God. 
and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had laid down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, your sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation, and where do you come from? What is your country, and of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you? that the sea may quiet down for us, for the sea grew more and more temptuous. He said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea, then the sea will quiet down for you, for I know that it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Here ends the Old Testament reading. We now continue with the verses of Psalm 107. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say this, whom he has redeemed from trouble. Some went down to the sea in ships. They saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works in the deep. For he commanded and raised the stormy wind which lifted up the waves of the sea. They mounted up to heaven, they went down to the depths, their courage melted away in their evil plight. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He made the storm be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad that the waters were quieted. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, forevermore. Amen. The epistle reading is from Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 10. Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. 
Here ends the epistle. Please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel for this Sunday is from the 8th chapter of the Gospel according to St. Matthew, verses 23 through 27. And when Jesus got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves, but he was asleep. And they went and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this, that even winds and sea obey him? Here ends the reading of the Holy Gospel. God be praised for his glad tidings. Let us confess the holy Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again in glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated as we sing hymn number 209.
Dear souls that are loved by Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I think that if any of us were going to go for a boat ride, we would check the weather first. Nowadays, that's easy. You don't have to hardly know anything to use a weather app on your smartphone that'll tell you the forecast for the rest of today and tomorrow and even the next 10 days. And even if you don't have a smartphone with a weather app, it's not usually very hard to tell what the weather is going to be doing in the near future. If the sun is shining and there's no clouds and no wind, then it's probably not going to rain. But if it's dark and clouds are gathering and the wind is blowing, it's probably going to storm. Matthew doesn't tell us in today's Gospel reading how the weather looked when the disciples followed Jesus into a boat and began to sail across the Sea of Galilee. It's possible that when the disciples followed Jesus into the boat, the weather was already looking bad. And even though the disciples normally wouldn't have wanted to sail with the weather looking like that, they figured it was fine because they were with Jesus. But it's also possible that when the disciples followed Jesus into the boat, the weather looked perfectly fine and clear. It didn't have to be a naturally occurring storm that Matthew describes in these verses. It could have been a storm that God sent out of the blue to accomplish his purpose. We know that's what God did with Jonah. When God told Jonah to go to Nineveh and preach repentance, Jonah didn't want to go. Nineveh was the capital city of the hated Assyrian Empire. Why should those people have a chance to repent of their sins and be forgiven by God? They should only be condemned for their great evil, thought Jonah. So instead of traveling east to Nineveh, Jonah went the opposite direction to the Mediterranean Sea, and he boarded a ship. But this wasn't going to work for God. So as we heard, God hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. The great storm that God hurled at Jonah, I love that terminology, it kept raging until Jonah admitted to the sailors that the reason why the storm had come was because he was running away from God. And when the sailors threw Jonah into the water as he told them to, the ship was saved from sinking, and right away, the storm vanished. Now, when Jonah was being thrown overboard, he probably expected that he was going to drown as punishment from God for his disobedience. But God hadn't hurled that storm at Jonah because he was angry. It was actually the opposite. God sent that storm because he is merciful and forgiving. Even though Jonah had disobeyed him, God still wanted Jonah to go to Nineveh and preach repentance to the people there. So instead of letting Jonah drown, God saved him through what is described as a great fish that swallowed Jonah and then spit him out onto the shore three days later. And from there, Jonah went to Nineveh and he preached repentance and the people there believed. So we can see what God accomplished through the storm that he hurled at Jonah. But what did God want to accomplish with the storm that threatened to sink the ship that Jesus and his disciples were sailing on? Was God just giving them a scare, like how dads will sometimes pretend that a boat they are on with their kids is sinking? No, God wasn't just messing with the disciples or trying to scare them. He was doing something important with that storm. God one of the disciples to have a greater faith in Jesus. And after the storm came and went, they did. Before getting into the boat with his disciples, Jesus had been a very busy man. For days, he had been constantly preaching and performing miracles, always followed by great crowds, as we heard last week. So we should not be surprised when we are told that Jesus fell asleep in the front of the boat. After all, Jesus was not just God. He was also a man with the same physical needs that we have. During his earthly life, Jesus got hungry and thirsty and tired, just like we do. 
we should be comforted by the fact that Jesus fell asleep in the front of the boat. It proves that Jesus became one of us to save us. But the disciples were not comforted when they saw Jesus sleeping in the front of the boat. They assumed that because Jesus was asleep, he was just as helpless and unaware of what was going on around him as any of us would be when we are asleep. But that's where the disciples were wrong. Yes, Jesus was asleep, but that didn't mean he was unaware or defenseless or unable to protect them. The disciples did do the right thing by waking Jesus up, though. If you're in danger, then it's always a good idea to go to Jesus. And Jesus did not criticize his disciples for waking him up. But when he was awake, the disciples didn't just say to him, Save us, Lord. They said, Save us, Lord. We are perishing. Save us, Lord, is a statement of faith. Save us, Lord, we are perishing, isn't. The disciples didn't think that Jesus knew they were in danger because they thought if he did, obviously he would have done something about it and not let them feel so afraid of their lives. By the way, we should not think the disciples were overreacting compared to how we would have felt if we had been in the boat with them. Remember that Andrew, Peter, James, and John had all been professional fishermen before Jesus called them to be his disciples. So the fact that they were scared shows us that this storm was no joke. But the disciples were never actually in danger. Jesus was never not in control of the situation. Because after asking the disciples, why are you afraid, O you of little faith, Jesus showed them that he was more aware and more in control of the situation than they even could have imagined. It would have been impressive enough if Jesus had used his divine powers to quickly bring the boat to shore. And maybe that's what the disciples wanted Jesus to do. But Jesus didn't just remove himself and the disciples from the danger posed by the storm. He removed the storm. That day, Jesus showed his disciples that there was never a moment where they couldn't believe in him. And through these words that have been recorded by inspiration and handed down to us by God's providence, Jesus shows this to us too. Now, are we ever going to find ourselves riding in a boat with Jesus on the Sea of Galilee when a storm comes up? No, I don't think so. But there are times in our lives when we feel like a storm has been hurled at us. And like the disciples, we wonder, is Jesus asleep? Does he know what is happening to me? If God never would have caused that storm to rise on the Sea of Galilee, then yes, the disciples wouldn't have felt like they were in danger. And they would not have been tempted at that moment to doubt Jesus and his power and his concern for them. But because God allowed the disciples to experience that storm and then to see Jesus' power over the storm, their faith in Jesus was strengthened. And the same is true for us. Because with all the storms and afflictions and times of trial that you have experienced in your life so far, have any of them killed you? No, because by God's grace, here you are. Through every storm that God has sent to you or allowed to come to you for reasons that you might know like Jonah or for reasons that you may never know in this life, God has never forsaken you. He has always been watching over you and caring for you in unseen ways because you are valuable to him. Your life was worth Jesus giving his life on the cross to redeem you. The death and resurrection of Jesus shows clearly and forever that God loves you and cares about you and that he forgives you for all of your sins, including for those times when you have sinfully doubted that God loves you and cares about you and knows what is happening in your life. It's true that there are times in our lives 
when we might wish that God would use his power over creation more or differently to save us or those whom we love from experiencing fear or discomfort or disease or the threat of death. But no matter what, you are always better off with Jesus being in control of your life, even if it seems like he is fast asleep, compared to you being in control of your life perfectly wide awake. And just like the disciples were right to wake Jesus up when they were afraid, you are always welcome to cry out to Jesus in prayer and to come and find Jesus where he says he always will be found in the word and sacraments. Jesus does not invite you to nag him and criticize him for not being the exact kind of Lord and Savior you think he should be. But he is always willing to answer when you say to him, Lord, save me. And in fact, Jesus is also willing to answer you when you say to him, Lord, save me, I am perishing. Because God doesn't snuff out or ignore a weakly burning wick. Even if your faith in Jesus is weaker than it should be, like all of our faith in Jesus, a weak faith is still a saving faith because it connects you to Jesus, who is never weak and never unaware and never unwilling to show you his mercy and forgiveness. We know what God's purpose was in sending that storm on the Sea of Galilee when Jesus and his disciples were sailing there. It was to show the disciples who Jesus really was and what he was able to do so that they would believe in him more. And even though we do not know the specific reason for all the storms and times of trial, that God sends or allows to come to us, we do know God's overall purpose for those things, that we would come to Jesus, we would see his power to save us, and we would believe in him. Amen. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Please rise. Let us pray for the church and for all people according to their needs. O Lord, your son is the greater Jonah, who was cast into the depths of our sin to bring peace, and who has risen after three days. In every trouble, let us cry out to him in true faith, and so find his care and not perish. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, bless the preaching of your gospel throughout this world as it refreshes your saints and works faith in those who are lost in error and unbelief. Sustain your preachers. Turn them from reluctance, bitterness, or discouragement to embrace their task and whatever cross it may bring. Today we especially pray your blessings upon our brother and former pastor, Aaron Hamilton, and our sister congregation, Redeemer Lutheran Church in Scottsdale, as he will be installed there today as their new pastor. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, turn us toward our neighbors in our workplaces and in our homes, that we may love them as ourselves and do them no wrong as your law has commanded us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, you sent your servant Jonah to call out against the great evil, against the city of Nineveh and its evil. Do not let us flee our duty to speak truthfully in the face of evil and to confess your goodness in a world which rejects Christ and his church. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Save us, Lord, and increase our faith, for without you we perish. Calm our fears with your presence and gracious and sure promises in Christ. Look especially upon your servant, Phineas Bader, and all those whom we name in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, draw us unto yourself, gathered around the holy body and precious blood of your Son, 
in the sacrament of the altar. Sustain us in saving faith, that we may eat and drink for the forgiveness of our sins. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, have mercy upon us, and according to your will and timing, deliver us from all the trials and afflictions that we experience in life. Through these, enliven our hearts to faith, hope, and prayer. Let us see your grace and fatherly help, and with all your saints, praise and worship you forever. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one true God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for the offering. Please rise for the preface. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts unto the Lord. We lift up our hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is good and right so to do. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God. And now we praise you that you sent us your only begotten Son, and that in him, being found in fashion as a man, you manifested the fullness of your glory. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying,
our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me.
Please rise. Let us give thanks and pray. We thank you, Lord God Almighty, that you have refreshed us with these your salutary gifts. And we beseech you of your mercy to strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. seated as we sing hymn 210. O Lord, we render unto you our heartfelt thanks that you have taught us what you would have us believe and do. Help us, O God, by your Holy Spirit, for the sake of Jesus Christ, to keep your word in pure hearts, that we thereby may be strengthened in faith, perfected in holiness, and comforted in life and death. Amen. 